Hello, and welcome to module 5.7 of the GPS MOOC. In this video, we're going to look at limits to coherent integration. So let's just set the context again. Remember, this is what the signal looks like at the satellite, the block diagram at the satellite, signal travels to Earth, and we pick it up in our receiver with a block diagram like that. And then what we're looking at is integrating that signal, and this part of the receiver we doing what we call coherent integration in that anything that happens to the phase here is reflected as we add up these signals. If the phase changes by 180 degrees, that's going to be reflected in here while we add up the signal. And, and we're going to look at that in some detail uh, in this video. And so that's the context. And the, the point, as always, is that that signal that we're receiving is buried in noise, and that's why we have to do this integration to pull the signal out of the noise. And from the previous video, we saw that the ideal coherent gain was this value in dBs of 10, log 10, the number of coherent samples. And then there were some uh, practical uh, losses that we had to take into account. But this formula shows you that if you could somehow increase this value of m, if you could carry on sampling for longer, you could increase your overall gain. And so there's a, a, a desire to integrate coherently as long as possible. And so that's what we're going to look at now is, well, what happens if you try that? Well, what happens is that problems arise, and they, they fall into three categories. The first problem is that there are data bit transitions, which we'll look at first. There's also frequency errors that occur. And if the velocity of the receiver changes, that is a problem. So we'll look at each of those now. So in this block diagram, just focus on the data part of the signal in the satellite. Remember that in the satellite, the, the carrier wave here is modulated by the PRN code at, at a high rate. What? one megabit per second. And in synchronous with this, there's a data signal at a much slower rate, 50 bits per second. So every 20 milliseconds, you can have a data bit, i.e. a change of plus or minus 1 on top of this PRN code, which is changing from plus to minus 1 at a, at a much higher rate, at once every microsecond. So, uh, so every now and again, when you would have had a phase change here from the PRN code, the data bit can be on top of that and undo the phase change, or vice versa. But one way or another, you'll, every time there's a data bit, the phase is off by 180 degrees from what it would have been in the absence of the data, in the presence only of the PRN code. So now think about that signal down at our receiver where we're looking for this PRN code. And We've said here it's the received PRN code, but it's also got the data. Now we're going to focus on the data, which we've kind of ignored until now. We don't know what the data is when we're, just tr when we're still trying to acquire the signal. So here we've got our local PRN code, but we're receiving PRN code plus data. So what that means is that where there's a data bit, this part of the signal will have a phase change of 180 degrees, and this part of the signal will not. And because all of this is coherent, that means that there'll be a phase change of 180 degrees in some of the signal. I've mentioned before that at this stage, we can just take magnitude so that we get the peak coming in the right direction, not going down like that. But while we're adding up, we haven't got a peak yet. And so that's what we're going to look at now. What happens to that little peak that's busy growing inside this integration if there's a phase change? So let's look at that next. So the way to imagine that is imagine we're integrating for three milliseconds in total. And after each millisecond, we're getting a little peak like this. So we've shown it quite big here, but it might be really quite small, like we saw in that MATLAB example previously. So there might be some small little peak. And we're adding them up. And well, they'd get three times bigger if we look at it like this. But it doesn't really work like this if there are data bits. If they're data bits, then we get a phase change of 180 degrees where the data bit occurs. So we're showing the data here. So imagine that for these two milliseconds, there's no data bits, and then a data bit occurs. And so there's a 180 degree phase change right there. Well, that means inside that integration, you'd get a positive peak, 
positive peak a millisecond later, and then a negative peak. So what happens is this coherent sum, instead of being three times bigger than it was, these last two peaks just cancel each other out, and you get no benefit from three milliseconds of integration compared to one millisecond of integration. And you can see that if you keep on doing this for too long over many data bits, then you'll just have negative peaks adding up to positive peaks, and you, you'll get nothing out of your coherent integration when you were hoping to get a nice big peak. So that's the problem with data bits. And with assisted GPS, there is a concept of something known as data wipe-off, where if you knew the data bits in advance, you could account for that, and you could say, well, I know a data bit is coming at this stage, and you could correct for this phase change. But that really happens in practice uh, the, for two reasons. One, you would have to know the timing to better uh, th than a millisecond or the, to about a millisecond accuracy in, in advance, and you'd have to know the data in advance. And that's quite a difficult thing to know in advance. So it's, it's really implemented in practice. And, and apart from the fact that it's, it's somewhat problematic to implement, even if you implement it, there are other limits to how long you can do coherent integration. We're going to look at those now. So the next thing is the fact that we, while ideally we would like it that we'd wiped off the carrier wave and, the, and a series of integration peaks looked exactly like this, you'll remember that we discussed when we had mixes that you never really get the frequencies exactly the same. And in fact, your PRN code still has some slight modulation. And so a sequence of correlations would also have some slight modulation. So instead of looking like a little sequence of peaks, like this, even in the absence of data, you'd get a peak, but then it's being modulated by the residual frequency after your mixer. And so this middle peak is multiplied by nothing, and this peak gets multiplied by a uh, phase change of 180. And so you get, again, you'd get positive and negative peaks. And this is something we've analyzed in detail. And this is showing you in the time domain exactly why we get this result, where the, if we have our frequency wrong, we get the sync function. And what we've shown here is, is how would we get the nulls on the sync function. If you get the frequency wrong by just the right amount, then when you integrate the signal, you add up positive and negative peaks, and you'd be down here on the sync function. And so how to do this analysis, you've seen in some detail the sync function sine pi f t over pi f t. And so this is a, a, another limit to how much integration you can do. However, we have seen that, that you can search the search space and find where this peak happens to be. So, so there are ways to deal with this. However, there's another problem to deal with, which is change in receiver velocity. So, so what does that do? Well, a change in receiver velocity will cause a change in the phase of the signal coming in. And the maximum acceptable change in receiver velocity is going to be if you change velocity by one wavelength in the amount of time that you did the coherent integration. And think about that. If you, if you change by one wavelength, then, instead of, then you'll have a perfect number of positive and negative mini peaks. And so they'll add up and cancel each other. And so that's the limit on how much change in receiver velocity you could possibly have in, your, in the TC, the integration time. So if you, if you want to plot that, you say, well, one wavelength over the coherent integration time is 19 centimeters over TC, and we plot that. And what we see is that the maximum change in receiver velocity is really quite modest. You, you get a, for a coherent integration time of 20 milliseconds, shown here, 20 milliseconds, the, the maximum change in velocity is about 36 kilometers per hour. There's this value here. And you imagine if you're driving in a car, you could quite easily change velocity by something of that order of magnitude in a short amount of time. And so what we see from this is that 20 milliseconds is kind of a natural limit in how long you would want to do coherent integration, regardless of how long the data bits are. And that's one of the reasons that, in practice, we don't do data bit wipe off very often, because the data bits themselves are 20 milliseconds. So you see, a, so this 20 milliseconds really is has nothing to do with the data bits being 20 milliseconds, just a coincidence. But it shows that GPS was designed quite well, that the length of the data bit gives you a nice maximum coherent integration length of about 20 milliseconds, which is enough to deal with change in velocity. I just want to mention constant velocity for a moment. The, the, 
this plot doesn't mean that the velocity of the receiver is limited by anything. You could have a constant velocity of anything you like, and if we skip back a slide, that would just mean that you'd have a constant offset in frequency, and we know how to deal with that. It would mean that this, this peak would be offset by some amount to the left or right, and we already know how to search these frequency bins. So, and we, we actually looked in some detail into how wide to make the space to search for that when we looked at frequency bins. So if you were designing a receiver for a, uh, a jet aircraft or uh, for a rocket or something, you just design into that how much, how wide you want your frequency bins and you'll be able to find the signal at any velocity. But your change in velocity has to be taken into account when you look at how long you want to make your coherent integration time. So, so don't mix up change in velocity with constant velocity. So those, those are the, the, the three things that limit how long we want to do to coherent integration. So to conclude this video, we, we basically have this simple statement that you, you just can't integrate coherently for too long, even if you did have data book wipe off. And what does too long mean? It means tens of milliseconds. So you've seen 20 milliseconds is, is a reasonable number. You can push it a little bit longer if you had data book wipe off, but not that much longer because of the, the reasons we've just described.